And Dave Ramchak is a computer specialist with a strong interest in uh, the Zodiac Cipher. Zodiac Killer was a serial killer back in the early 1970s, sent a number of coded messages, most of which are still unsolved. And so if you have a few moments and would like to uh, tackle a pressing criminal issue, I welcome you to uh, take a look at that. But Dave also has a very interesting website on these issues. Let's talk about the Zodiac Ciphers. This is the famous 340 character unsolved Zodiac Cipher. As Dan said, it's on the top 10 list for the FBI, it's a list of unsolved ciphers. So there's a lot of interest in solving this. It's been almost 50 years since this was published in the newspapers. I think it's 46 to be exact. So a lot of people have been working on this for a long time. I saw this code about 10 years ago. I thought I would take a crack at it because I have a background in programming and I like puzzles. So I thought, you know, that's a deadly combination. You end up getting stuck working on this stupid thing. <laughs> So since I couldn't solve it, I started to collect information about interesting ideas and facts and observations about the four ciphers that he sent. And that's to address the first question in my topic, which is what do we know about them? The second question I want to explore is when can we stop trying to solve them? And to address that, we're going to talk about a technique that I came up with to try to rule out ideas about how this specific code may have been enciphered. Quick background on the Zodiac Killer. He was a serial killer uh, active in the late 60s, early 70s in the San Francisco Bay Area of California. At first he was targeting young couples in isolated locations. At least it seemed like he was targeting them. But he broke that pattern when he killed a cab driver in downtown San Francisco. And there were witnesses to that crime and that's how we got this composite sketch of the suspect. And then there was a survivor from one of the other attacks who described his costume that he was wearing during that attack. And while he was active, he sent a bunch of letters to newspapers and basically scared the crap out of the entire San Francisco Bay Area. And the newspapers just kept publishing his letters and his cryptograms. And this had a uh, very terrorizing effect on people. So here are the four ciphers. The first one is his longest message. It's 408 characters. That's the only one that's been solved. It only took about a week for somebody to come up with a solution to that once it was published. The other three are unsolved. The 340, I think, has the best chance of recovering a message because it's, it seems to be long enough. There aren't too many symbols that would prevent you from finding a solution if it was a standard substitution cipher. But the other two ciphers he sent are way too short. One of them is only 13 symbols and the other is 32. I'll talk about those first so we can get those out of the way. So the 13 symbol cipher by the time he sent this, his other two ciphers had been published. The first one had been solved pretty quickly. And then he had the second one published in the papers. And it had been in the papers for a few months and nobody had offered any solution to it. So he says in this letter, by the way, have you cracked the last the cipher I sent you? My name is blank. He gives this sequence of 13 symbols. It's not much to work with, but if you look at the symbols, you notice that there are quite a few repeated symbols, which is unusual for a cipher this short. It makes it a little tricky to find solutions to fit in such a tightly constrained cipher text, but you can put together a computer program that tests millions and millions of combinations of words and names, and you can come up with all kinds of nonsense like this. This is a very small sample of what you can get. So there's no good way to distinguish or like a real solution from one of these. The uh, 32 symbol cipher that he sent later has the same issue. This one came with a map and the map had a location marked on it. And he said, if you use this map combined with the code, you can find out where I buried a bomb that I'm gonna to use to blow people up. But if you look at the cipher, it's got 29 unique symbols in it. So there's only three repeated symbols, which means it's basically only three steps away from being a one-time pad, as hard to solve as a one-time pad. But later he sent another letter that included a hint. He said, the code concerns radians and inches along the radians. So apparently he's giving some kind of angular measurement plus a distance. And you can come up with all different ways to state that kind of measurement and try to fit it in the code, but there's just too many of them. You still end up with a huge pile of candidate solutions. So it's pretty hopeless. I don't see how this could possibly be solved without discovering some secret key that is in a locker somewhere. All right, so back to the first cipher that he sent, the 408. 
He had split the cipher into three equal pieces and sent them to newspapers, demanding that they publish them, otherwise he was going to go on a killing rampage. The newspapers obliged, they published the cipher. And then in less than a week, a high school teacher named Donald Harden and his wife Betty came up with this solution. I like killing people because it's so much fun, it's more fun than killing wild game in the forest, etc., etc. Lunatic ramblings. But the key that they came up with breaks down at the end. There's this last this sequence of uh, 18 symbols that is basically gibberish. And nobody knows yet why that is. It turns out the cipher is a homophonic substitution cipher. So it's a simple substitution cipher, but instead of just having one symbol assigned to each letter, you have multiple symbols assigned to each letter. And that disguises the letter frequencies. So you can't just look at the most common symbols and go, hey, that's got to be the letter E. But the Hardens were pretty clever. In newspaper articles at the time that they published their solution, said that they expected that the killer would use the word kill often in the message. And they were trying to find patterns where the word would fit. And so this shows the most common bigrams, the two symbol pairs, in the ciphertext. And so that's a pretty good clue of where the word kill might appear. And upon guessing what these symbols might stand for and replacing them throughout, you can be on your way to recovering the entire message. Okay, back to the last 18 symbols. In the letters that came with the ciphers, Zodiac said that if you decode the 408, it's going to have my identity in it. And so the plain text up until the last 18, they don't say anything about an identity. So people believed, well, maybe his name is in this last this section at the end. And so people started to do anagramming on the last portion to try to see if a name would pop out. And these are two that were published around that time. One of them is Robert Emmett the Hippie, which is not even a good anagram because it's missing three of the letters. <laughs> and then there's Timothy Feebert. I feel sorry for him if he was a real person. You can find all kinds of stuff with just 18 letters. And there's some nonsense ones that I came up with. I'm here to bite the pie. The eerie poet bit him. So you, you can come up with all sorts of things. As it turns out, there are 740 billion possible ways to scramble just that 18 letters. So anagramming is not a great technique for finding solutions to things, but people keep trying it. <laughs> There's another explanation for the last 18. Some people have suggested that maybe he was just filling out the ciphertext so it would split into three equal-sized pieces so he could mail them to the newspapers. And he didn't want to give any hint about which piece would come before which other piece. So if you look at the bottom row, which is presumed to be filler, he may have copied symbols directly from above to produce the random symbols that he was putting in as filler. And this kind of feature happens with random text, but what makes this more compelling is that this sequence with the backwards Q, E, and H, and M is perfectly preserved down at the bottom. It's not conclusive evidence that it's filler, but it's, it's highly suggestive of that. Zodiac was also known to make many mistakes in his spelling in the letters. He was a very bad speller. And when the Hardens applied their key, they discovered similar misspellings in the plain text. For instance, dangerous ended up being spelled as danger to because of the way the symbol assignments were done. And most was spelled as moat. But there's something interesting about the symbol assignments, which is if you correct the misspellings, the symbols that are associated with the correction tend to resemble the symbols that were erroneously put in. For instance, in moat, the black triangle decodes to A. But, but the, the letter that's supposed to be there is an S. Elsewhere in the cipher, the S is stood for by the dotted triangle. So when you do the correction, you see that there's a similar triangle shape that represents the correct letter. And a lot of these misspellings, when you correct them, have this quality. The shapes are very similar. In the homophonic substitution ciphers, you can often find these kinds of patterns, which give code breakers another angle of attack into this kind of cipher. Marked here are the symbols that stand for the letter E, the most common letter. And then if you write them all out in sequence, you get these very regular cycles of symbols that Zodiac used to stand for the letter E. So he was going through them very regularly up until the last part of the cipher where it kind of breaks down. So if you're looking at ciphers like this, you can look for these kinds of patterns, which is a pretty easy thing to do. You can do brute force search and find them all, and then figure out what symbols they stand for. All right, let's talk about the 340. The 340 seems very similar to the 408, has a lot of the same symbols, 
He left out a few symbols, removed a few symbols. Those are shown at the top. He also added some, shown at the bottom there. The effect of adding new symbols and shortening the length of the ciphertext makes it a little bit harder to solve. Uh, obviously, it's really hard to solve because it's still not solved. So we're interested to know what direction is the message written in. And one hint in this area is to look at how many symbols repeat in each row and how many symbols repeat in each column. These diagrams show a comparison of the 408 and the 340 and how the symbols repeat along the rows and columns. But the interesting part of this is the yellow rows. The yellow rows have no repeated symbols. And we know that the 408 has a written message written horizontally, normal reading order. And when you're doing homophonic encipherment, this tends to spread the symbols out because the code writer is not quick to reuse the same symbols as he's going along. And you don't see the same kind of non-repetition in the vertical direction. And it's interesting that the 340 shows a similar quality. It has many rows that don't repeat. So it seems to favor this horizontal direction. So maybe that's a vote for it written in a horizontal direction. Dan had an idea that he's talked about before. If you look at the 340, the green line is the exact middle of the ciphertext. You'll notice the symmetry between the two parts. They each start with three lines that have no repeated symbols in them. So his idea was maybe the cipher was originally written twice as wide and then sliced in half and then put one over the other. People have been trying different variations of that. Still haven't come up with anything, but it's an interesting idea. Here's more of his sloppiness. He had written down the letter K, the forward K, but scratched out and wrote down a backwards K. So maybe he was confused about the symbols again when he was looking at his key or transcribing the ciphertext onto another piece of paper. Another way to investigate the reading direction of the message in the 340 is to look at the repeated bigrams. So this is showing all the repeated bigrams of the 408. You can see there's very many of them that are in the normal reading direction. In the 340, you don't see quite nearly as many. And in fact, if you do tests where you scramble the ciphertext and you want to see how many repeats are happening in random ciphertext on average, you get about 20. So it doesn't strongly favor the horizontal direction when you look at just the bigram package. You, if, if there was, was a message, message perfectly preserved in the horizontal direction, you would probably see more bigrams than what the 340 is showing. And additionally, if you slice the cipher and text in half and you count the bigrams in each section separately, the top half has many more bigrams in it than the bottom half. In fact, the bottom half only has one repeated bigram. Something in the encipherment of the 340 is disturbing the bigrams, the repeated bigrams. So now we can look at trigrams, the groups of three symbols that repeat in the 408 and the 340. Since the 408s, we know that's written in the horizontal reading order, the reading direction. So we would expect to see a lot of repeated trigrams, which we do. And the 340 is actually showing that it's favoring a horizontal reading direction based on the trigrams. So whatever is disturbing the bigram count doesn't seem to be disturbing the trigram count. And this is interesting to me because the Hardin said, we were looking for patterns where the word kill would fit. And they said, you know, these symbols were repeating as bigrams. So maybe Zodiac, when he was writing the 345, hey, I know how I can fool them. I can get rid of those repeated bigrams and take away one of these hints. Another interesting thing about these repeated trigrams is that the IOF pattern repeats directly above the other one, just like the QEHM repeats directly above the other one in the 408. The QEHM, I said earlier, is suspected to be part of this filler section. And so maybe the 340 has some kind of filler section that maybe this is related to that. Now there's another way to count bigrams. The programs that I was just showing are the ones that are really close to each other. They're only one position apart. I call them distance one. There's 25 of them. But if you count them at other distances, you get a lot more. These are examples of bigrams that are 19 positions apart. And you can see the kind of the repeating pattern. Maybe there's some kind of transposition going on that would cause that. But if you read from right to left and you consider the distance of 14, the number goes up even more and you get 40 repeats. And in random trials and scrambled ciphertexts, the peak number of repeated bigrams using this method, you would only expect about 30. It's hard to make a conclusion based on this, but it's an interesting aspect of the ciphertext. I showed before that the 408 has these strong patterns that result from homophonic substitution, where he was very orderly going through the symbol assignments for the letter E. You can look for similar patterns in the 340. These two are the strongest examples, I think, that are in there 
they only involve two symbols, the backwards L and the M, but they repeat perfectly, L, M, L, M, L, M, all the way down. Same thing with this upside down V and the square. But the problem is, if you do the scramble test again, and you compare to random cipher texts, it doesn't take very many shuffles of the text to produce similar behavior. And yet, there are other patterns like this in the cipher text. There seems to be a higher distribution of them in the 340 than there are in random cipher text. So maybe whatever he did to rearrange the cipher text disturbed the regularity of the symbol assignments. Sometimes when you stare at the cipher long enough, you see patterns that pop out. That may not be a healthy thing. <laughs> so this, here's an example. But these are interesting because you know, there's, there's trigrams that repeat in different directions. I call these pivots. So there's a pair of pivots. This implies that the underlying plain text are the same letters going in one direction and the other. So I did some experiments to see how often would this happen. Just if you were writing a normal ciphertext without trying to force these kinds of patterns to happen. And my analysis, I concluded that it was about 1 in 50,000. You had a 1 in 50,000 chance of these kinds of patterns happening by accident. So it makes me really wonder, is this somehow related to how this thing's been put together? More interesting patterns that pop out. I call these the box corners. In the green circles there, you have these very symmetrical box corners. They seem to indicate some region of the ciphertext. Maybe it's just seeing faces in clouds. I don't know. <laughs> but this makes it more interesting. The fact that each one occurs right in the middle of an O and a C symbol in both cases. So there's this repeating pattern in both sections. I don't know what to say about that other than there it is. And people do these goofy word searches. You can go through the cipher and like come up with these words, but they're pretty meaningless. But the last one, the one at the end, very much looks like he's signing the cipher with his name. If you interpret the solid triangle as a D, it very much looks like it says Zodiac, especially since it's connected to his signature that he used in his letters, the crosshair symbols. Another interesting thing is happening with odd and even positions in the ciphertext. At the top, I've written out all the letters from the odd-numbered positions. And then at the bottom, I've written out all the symbols from the even-numbered positions. And then I counted the repeating bigrams in both sections. And there's a big discrepancy between them. There's very few repetitions from the odd-numbered positions. And very many in the evens. If you, again, do random trials and you see how often that would happen by chance, less than 1% of the trials show this wide of a spread between the bigram counts. And the other interesting thing is you can see the box corner patterns in purple. The O square C, those were the box corners. Again, I don't know what to conclude from it other than there it is. So let's step back to my original question. When can we stop trying to solve this thing? <laughs> Obviously, if somebody comes up with an authenticated solution, we can stop. Or somebody comes up with evidence that there's no message to find in this thing. Some people have done that with the Beal ciphers. They've come up with good evidence that it probably hoaxes. But we still don't know, so let's try to find a solution. And the way to do this is to try out all these different ideas about how it might be enciphered. But I've not really seen a very uh, robust way to, to go through all these different ideas and rule them out. So I thought one way to approach this problem is to generate a big pile of test ciphers. So if you think, well, maybe there's a transposition scheme going on with this thing, let's create a bunch of test ciphers that implement that hypothesis. And then if you can break all of those, and you still can't break the 340, then it probably means that your hypothesis is wrong. So to start this project, I used a base hypothesis, which was that the 340 is made like the 408, the most commonly tested hypothesis. It's a homophonic substitution cipher. It's in a normal reading direction. It's basically, it's like the 408. It has all the uh, sloppiness from the 408, like misspellings, missing words, transcription errors. And so I came up with this cipher generator. The way it works is it looks through a big pile of books. It takes samples of plain text up to length 340. It injects random misspellings to try to simulate the bad spelling habits of the zodiac. It randomly removes words because we can see that from the, from the 408 solution. There's some words missing. It puts in sections of filler, like we're assuming that the last 18 of the 408 were filler. Maybe there's filler in the 340 as well. And these kinds of things will contribute to making it difficult for a substitution cipher to be solved. So the generator then creates random keys for these plain texts. And so you have a candidate ciphertext. 
then the algorithm will measure all these features that are associated with the generated cipher to try to, try to test like how close is it to the actual 340 because we want to maximize the similarity of all these weird little things uh, with the actual 340. And so I use a multi-objective -op optimization algorithm to do a search to find ciphers that have these qualities. Oh, and on the right there, the uh, symbol confusion groups refers to, it refers to the transcription errors. They're allowed to come from uh, different symbols in those groups. So these are some of the results. These are 340-like ciphers generated by this process. You can see they have a lot of the same patterns. They have the weird pivots. They have the little box corner patterns that repeat. They have the pseudo words that appear, including the zodiac signatures. They have real underlying plain texts. One comes from a Gilbert and Sullivan opera. One comes from the Count of Monte Cristo. One comes from the Les Miserables. They have the same number of repeating trigrams. Those are highlighted in red and green. They have the same bigram count. If you go in and count them, they're all the same as the original 340. And all the other qualities are similar as well. Why are we doing this? What's the point? It's a nice trade. Who cares? <laughs> well, it's having a pile of cipher texts. The, the other tests I've seen in the past are just people will come up with a test cipher that has a similar symbol distribution, but it won't mimic any of the other qualities. So you don't know for sure if your code breaking method will work under those circumstances. So the idea is to improve our code breaking skills under different hypotheses. And we want to verify that that hypothesis can make a Z40 Z340 like cipher. We want to see that things like the pivots may just be happy accidents. They might just be phantoms like that face on Mars. You look at it from a distance, it looks like something significant. You get close, it was just random noise. And the more of these you test successfully, increases the confidence that the hypothesis was wrong. And then you can move on to another idea. So a few other hypotheses. There's, a, there's basically an infinite number to pick from. <laughs> A few quick words about possible future directions. Apart from going through all these different hypotheses and testing the generated ciphers under each hypothesis, Knight and Noon came up with an interesting technique, a machine learning technique, where they were able to distinguish, automatically distinguish from 50 different types of ciphers, of classical ciphers. And I think these results can be improved by using what's known as ensemble classifiers, which they are set up to correct the weaknesses of other classifiers. So you put them all together and they work together to increase the predictive quality. There was a famous contest, the next Netflix prize, which was, you get a million dollars if you can build a predictor of movie ratings based on users' rating histories. Uh, if you can make the, the greatest improvement to that predictor. And they used a highly tuned classifier to, to increase the chances of uh, getting the correct predictions. So that makes me wonder, how would such a classifier trained on a huge test set of different cipher type types, how would it classify? It's an interesting open question. Thanks. Quick word to the three Zodiac forums, Zodiac Killer site, Zodiac Killer Facts, and ZodiacKiller.com. A lot of this material comes from all of this collective effort to investigate these ciphers. And there's more info at my site, ZodiacKillerCiphers.com. Thanks. You were working on the 340 cipher. You were coming back out to the cipher. Although I see as though you were assuming that it's a new set of substitutions. But has anyone taken the, the, the same characters and put in the plain text, which is the, from the first one, 408, was it? Yes. And then, then only work with that plain text. Obviously, it would be meaningless, but in other words, it could be possibly that was some sort of transposition. Uh, the plain text. What, in other words, why come out to the cipher database with different substitutions? Like you've gone back to scratch, you know, back to the, to the cipher and look for, you know, new substitutions if possible, uh, you know. Uh, well, you mean you may have done something with the 408's key? Take the 408 key, put it into the 340, and just come up with a meaningless, obviously, you know, plain text text. Yes. And then look at what the action tells you. Has anybody done that? Or is that? I think people have only done that first step of trying to plug in the 408 key into the, the first way. Then seeing that it's gibberish and then just giving up. I don't think anyone's explored mirror anything. This perhaps be applied at another, you know, another level to the, the initial symbols for all the symbols that are used. Yeah. So 
I think that'd be worth looking into. The, the tricky part of that is that some of the symbols in the 340 are brand new. Others were removed. So there are symbols from the 340s key that aren't represented in the uh, new symbol. So uh, it would have an interesting level of visibility. Um, there is some, if you apply the 4 rates key to the uh, 340, I think it's a, yeah, the 3, no, sorry, the, uh, the 13 symbol side, you can actually get it to say, we true. But, you know, there's these three neat symbols that are treated as nulls, because they they're not in the 4 way. Um, but, you know, that could just be more phantoms. <laughs> that might not be meaningful. Well, they put a few people I think that you are the developers are not complicit in the crime. Oh, the hardness? Mm -hmm. uh, that's, I've heard that theory before. I don't know of any direct evidence that that could be. I suppose it could be, but uh, that's the kind of thing that uh, people have, 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 have said that, and uh, there hasn't really been any direct evidence. So, so, in your opinion, they did have enough wherewithal in their background to do that? that yeah, thing. I think um, it wasn't that hard of a group of men. I mean, it was straight up humfine substitution cycle. There wasn't really anything all that difficult about it. You know, in hindsight, of course, we would say that. But if they hadn't gotten it, I'm pretty sure somebody else would have. I, I saw something in the, uh, I think it was the Lake Area Sub Police Report, that said that they, you know, the FBI had said, so they had practically the um, The FBI received the, the 408 cipher after it was solved and published. It took a while to get to us physically because it wasn't a federal case. It was a state case, and the FBI was only brought in for assistance. Uh, however, we used that cipher in training, uh, and all of our trainees, uh, it, we or any other similar ciphers, matched off of the 408, and it. Um, it's a difficult cipher, sure, but it's it's by no means um, the most difficult. And yeah, it is all. I know how qualified they were in particular. We have, I think we have one last question. Thank you. Yes, sir. I'm sorry I'm new to this. This is from Mr. Orichek. When you mentioned the, the triangles that were filled in and had the dots and the cadence, what's the chance that this guy was dyslexic? Mm -hmm. I think that's an idea that's come up before. Yeah, that's pretty good. It's hard to tell if he's putting on a, a, an act in his letters because you know he's trying to promote this persona and he's getting his letters published and he's like, hey, they're getting even more uh, notorious for this, so he keeps doing it. Um, so I don't know if it was an affectation on his part to put in his misspelling or if it really was. He just was terrible at spelling. So yeah, it, it's possible. That's one of the hypotheses. I didn't really get a chance to get into the different hypotheses to explore. One of them is. Maybe he wasn't as clever as he thought when he came up with a new scheme and he screwed it up somehow. You know, because we saw evidence that he was confusing the symbols, that he was making the spellings, he was leaving words out, he was scratching out the symbols in the 340. So there's a good chance that maybe he saw a book somewhere that had some decipherment method and he screwed it up. And we ended up 50 years later wasting our time on the thing. <laughs> I'd like to thank you all for your attention and interest, and we'll be moving on to the next portions of our program. Thank you very much. There are some things I didn't have a chance to talk about during my presentation due to time constraints, so I thought I would talk about that now. One of the mistakes Zodiac made was he seems to have left out some words or a phrase between parts one and two of his 408 cipher. Here you can see the section where part one ends and part two begins, and the plain text says, When I die, I will be reborn in paradise, and all the I have killed will become my slaves. There's something missing there. All the I have killed. He may have originally meant to say, all the people I have killed, but I'm curious to know what he left out. He may have left out an even larger portion of plain text here. It's interesting that it happens between the two parts. Two days after the Hardens cracked the 408, someone known only as the Concerned Citizen mailed a card and a valid solution key to Sergeant Lynch of the Vallejo Police Department. So far, nobody really knows who sent this. People have speculated that it may have been one of the Hardens, 
or maybe even the Zodiac himself, but it could have been just some other person who saw the published solution in the newspapers and decided to derive his own key based on that. Here is an excerpt of the FBI's analysis of the key which confirms the validity of the key. There's one unusual aspect to it, which is that the Q, for some reason, is assigned to the plain text letters K and L. It's understood why the other key assignments are there, but I don't know where K and L came from for the symbol Q. Someone on the forums noticed this interesting aspect of the key for the 408. If you look at the plain text to symbol assignments, you find that some of them are grouped together on standard keyboard layouts. For instance, the plain text letter B and the cipher symbol V both appear right next to each other on a keyboard. Similarly, plain text letter D and cipher symbol F also appear together on the keyboard. And there are a few other examples illustrated here. The strongest example is the plain text letter I, which is associated with the symbols P, U, and K. And those all appear together on a keyboard, clustered together here in the upper right corner. This is an interesting quality. It's hard to say if it was intentional. You can run key shuffling experiments to estimate how often this happens by chance. Depending on how you set up the experiment, about between half a percent and 10% of shuffled keys exhibit this behavior. Here's another interesting thing about the 408's key that someone on the forums discovered. If you write down all of the symbols from the key and you eliminate all of the special symbols, that is, symbols that are shapes or backwards letters, and you leave only the alphabetical symbols, and then you write the plain text letter assignments, you can start playing this kind of game where you pick a letter. For instance, the letter T. Now the cipher symbol T in this key decodes to plain text letter O. Then you take the O, treat it like a cipher symbol, and you find that it decodes to plain text letter N. The cipher symbol N decodes to plain text letter E, and then finally the cipher symbol E decodes to itself. It decodes to the plain text letter E. The interesting thing about this is if you do this for every letter of the alphabet, you find that each letter leads to the letter E. So all letters are leading to the letter E except for C because this cipher symbol C does not appear in the 408. But for some reason all the other letters lead to one final letter, the letter E. Again, you can do a key shuffling experiment to measure how often this happens by chance. And you find that only 3% of shuffled keys end up with all but one letter leading to one final letter. In the majority of shuffled keys, what you actually find are cycles, such as the letter A leading to B and then back to A, or you end up with different groups that lead to different letters. For instance, one group will lead to the letter Q, and another group will lead to the letter H. Those scenarios are a lot more common than this phenomenon of leading to a single letter. It's hard to conclude from this if this is an intentional feature of the key or some reflection of how he created the key, but it makes you wonder, what steps did Zodiac go through to create the key? Knowing how he created the key for the 408 might help understand how he might have done the same for the 340. Over the years, numerous people have come forward claiming to have solved the 340. A noteworthy example of this is Robert Graysmith. He wrote the popular and best-selling book about the Zodiac case in 1986. The case had gone pretty cold by then, but he brought a lot of attention back to the case, and he dug up some new information and published it in his book. But he also made some outlandish claims, such as that he had definitively solved the 340, and that his solution was endorsed by two people from the American Cryptogram Association. He came up with this substitution key, applied it to the ciphertext, and ended up with this stream of plain text. You can find some words in this stream of plain text, but a lot of it is gibberish. So Graysmith makes a mistake that many other code breakers have made. He has taken the letters from the gibberish plain text and rearranged them to make other words appear. Using this anagram technique is problematic because of the numerous possibilities. He's able to find some words that are interesting to him, but if you go through the same steps, you can generate many other words. So it's impossible to know which words are the intended ones if this was how Zodiac had created the cipher. Here's an interesting coincidence. If you take two standard sized pieces of paper, eight and a half inches wide by 11 inches in length, and you divide the pieces of paper into equal half inch squares, you end up with these sheets that have 17 columns and 22 rows. 
If you write both ciphers, the 340 and the 408, back to back, you end up filling both sheets exactly with no leftover squares. It's an interesting coincidence. Does it mean that Zodiac drafted both of his ciphers together on two sheets of paper? It's an interesting question. Here's a really strange thing that someone discovered. Let's say you label each position of the 340, starting at 1 and counting to 340. And then you mark all of the numbers that are prime. These are indicated with boxes in the ciphertext. And then consider the plus symbol. The plus symbol is the most frequently occurring symbol in the 340. It's in there 24 times, which is unusual, actually, because in a homophonic substitution cipher, you would expect most of the symbols to be flattened, so there isn't one particular symbol that would stand out. But the plus sign does stand out. It's actually occurring twice as often as the next most common symbol. So it has an unusual frequency. But in any case, if you look at which plus symbols fall on prime numbered positions, you find that there's only one that does so. And the reason this is unusual is because, on average, you would expect more than one plus symbol to fall on a prime position because there are so many pluses. They have many opportunities to fall on prime positions. The same thing's true of the second most common symbol, the letter B. It's happening 12 times in the ciphertext, but it only falls on a prime position once. What could explain this? I have no idea. You can do another cipher shuffling experiment to see how often this phenomenon occurs, and you find that in less than 1% of shuffles, the top two symbols each fall on only one prime position. In the photograph of the 340, there's a forensic ruler where the major divisions are marked out to half inches. They indicate that the paper dimensions are seven and a quarter inches wide and ten and a half inches in length. And this corresponds to what's known as monarch sized paper. And if you look even closer at the scans, you can find watermarks for Fifth Avenue. Fifth Avenue was a brand of linen paper that was sold by Woolworths. And here's an advertisement from the 60s showing that this sized paper was sold by Woolworths.